to Welcome to the June Pro Organic Belize Speakers Meeting. Um, this speakers meeting is going to be Maya Forest Gardens panel discussion. We have several people on that will be talking to us today. So before we get started, a few rules. Um, please try to keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking, if you're on the panel. Um, also, during the meeting, if we have any questions from the audience, the way we are going, we like to handle our questions through the speakers meeting is you can send a message to the Pro Organic host on the meeting and Jenny will ask your question during the question and answer section at the very end. So that's so we will not have everybody on the meeting talking at once. Um, after we do the introduction and, and our speakers do their presentation, we'll do a five minute intermission where we'll have a poll. After that intermission, we will open up for our question and answer section where everybody can ask whatever questions they might have to our panelists and the panelists will decide who in the panel will take the question. All right, little introduction for Pro Organic Belize, for those of you who are new to the organization. Um, hopefully you have visited, visited our Facebook page and our Facebook group. We use our Facebook page to announce events like the one that we are having today. And we use our group for open discussion where you can go on and you can post questions and people that are members of that group can come in and answer and we can have open discussion on that. <clears throat> and also as an organization, we have Pro Organic membership, which we are always trying to promote for anyone who would like to join our organization and help out in any way that they can possibly help. Next, our volunteers, of course, helping out, helping out on any one of the organization or groups within the organization like the marketing or consumer group or any of the other outreaches that we participate in. Our certified farm program, we try to go out and of course last year was a little bit bad with COVID, but we're trying to get this ramp back up where we go out and we are certifying farms as pesticide free operations. And through those certified farms, we are offering produce through the consumer group to the public. So anybody that's interested in any of these activities can contact us and we can get you more information. You be can become a member, volunteer, or get information on how you can get your farm certified or get pesticide free produce. And of course, our topic of today is going to be Maya Forest Gardeners discussion. This should be a pretty good discussion, being that all of our people on this panel will be discussing local activities and local gardening, which is always important. And like I said, we're going to have our speakers speak for 45 minutes. We'll take a five minute intermission where we'll do our quick poll and then we will do probably about 30 minutes Q and A. Sometimes each of these run over depending on if our speakers get long winded and they want to talk, 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 talk. We let them go. And during the question and answers, if you have a lot of questions, hopefully we got a lot of answers. So we'll go ahead and get started with our panelists, if our panelists could please introduce yourself and let's get on with our presentation. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me or good afternoon? Yes. Yes. Are you seeing me? No, you would have to. Sh um... Only seeing the top of your head. You only see the top of my head? There you go. <laughs> Okay, beautiful. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. And isn't it ironic 
that I, Garifuna woman, Belize woman, I'm here in California, in Los Angeles. Um, Dr. Annabelle Ford and I have made a switch. So she's in Belize with our team. I want to briefly introduce our team. They can say more about themselves. And it is my charge to just give a little framework about how it is and why it is we do what we do. And I want to thank you for providing this space for us to share. I am actually being hosted by a Belizean family related to one of our team, um, Dr. Alfonso Sul. And um, this is how things have begun on at least on this journey with me and for me, where I was able to, um, my ancestral husband, Harriet Topsy, who died 26 years ago, I keep his memory because he is one of the pioneers from Belize or of Belize who presents the El Pilar. And we just give credit where credit is due. And on the journey of um, finding out more about the legacy and the heritage and the participation of Belizeans in this journey, I went in search of um, Dr. Annabelle Ford. And immediately as we met, and she tells the story better than I do, uh, I didn't know who she was. I had heard her name and went directly to her. And the rest is history, so to speak. And when she shared her work that she had um, come to Belize when she was 19 years young to explore from the United States and has been there ever since. I just want to give thanks for her presence. And I want to give thanks for all of those who came before us, those heroes and those sheroes on whose shoulders that we stand as indigenous people and people of the world. And as the Belizean National Anthem says, we explore wealth untold. That's part of the Belize National Anthem. And certainly, El Pilar is um, the source of much strength and much wealth untold. And it's a, it's a quietly kept secret which we would like to spread some more. In this journey of um, two women, that is Dr. Annabelle Ford and myself, walking on the same path, we have dreams, we have visions, and our passion in sharing this experience today is to explore the wealth untold and to affirm, affirm the strength of indigenous people, the Maya and Maya forest gardening, and inviting us to learn from the plants and the trees, which don't talk back plants and trees which recommend themselves at four levels. And, and Dr. Ford and the other eminent doctors will share that for us. Our four, four pillars are the following. One, we have the reserve, the site, the archeological, um, archeology under the canopy of the rainforest. That's El Pilar, which is very distinctive. It's a shared resource uh, in two countries one resource in two countries. And we see this as a potential for peace and for transformation, not just in Belize, not just in Central America, but in the world. And this was proven to us when there was all that heavy political debate and discussion about, um, about Belize and Guatemala, we continued to have that embrace people to people, plants to plants, biodiversity, as the plants and the trees recommend themselves. So it is our intention in this sharing to say that we have in the second pillar, not necessarily consequentially, um, we have the, the site, the, the um, visitor center in San Ignacio and anywhere in Belize where we can showcase this wealth and this strength, which provides solutions which we can explore especially in times of this COVID pandemic, we have seen this as an opportunity. Look at it right now. We're having conversations, we're having sharing, not only in Belize, but in the world. So the wealth that we have to offer 
Um, COVID has given us this opportunity to be innovative, to be creative, to build bridges, to make connections. Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, California, Belize, Maya, Garifuna, Mestizo, Creole, and so on and on. So the third pillar, which is one of the most, but not the only significant one for us, is the school garden. Because we believe through El Pilar, we provide a succession plan and a succession strategy where the history, the knowledge, the strength, the power of our heritage can be and will be and is integrated in the curriculum. So at Santa Familia, we have a model garden which is integrated into the school curriculum. And um, Dr. Narcisa Torres, Dr. Alfonso, and also Dr. Ovando are resource people along with the teachers, um, Dr. Ford and myself and many others coming from all over the world embrace and honor, celebrate and lift up. This is a part of a curriculum where our um, belief is that no child should be left indoors, that the world is a classroom. So even in this time of the COVID pandemic, um, we know that this is an opportunity provided for us where children who have been homeschooling can now be interviewing their elders, their mothers, their fathers, the neighbors, about the plants, the uses of the plants for food, for shelter, and addressing issues of climate change integrated within the curriculum. The fourth, not final, but certainly one of the most distinctive aspects of our work, the fourth pillar is that of um, Dr. Narcisa Sartoris, who provides a model of forest gardening, as I said, not just for Belize, but for the world because we have hundreds of researchers and practitioners coming from all over the world, studying this um, form of organic, um, natural, um, beautiful gardening that goes way back thousands of years ago. And we give him honor and we give him support and encouragement because he, he is fighting a battle juxtaposed between Mennonite um, pesticide, herbicide, whatever side, farming. He has been relentless in pursuing this type of gardening of his and our ancestry. So I want to conclude by inviting you to tell the story differently, to, to journey with us in celebrating different ways of knowing. It has been an honor and a privilege to be with Dr. Annabelle at the University of California, Santa Barbara, to really get a perspective that I would never have gotten had I not come here to the United States. It has been an honor and a privilege to speak with the chancellor of the University of California, Santa Barbara, who has deemed it fit to give Dr. Narciso Torres the highest award the university has can give, the Chancellor's Medal, which is something that we are going to celebrate in years to come. So we invite you as partners, and as Dr. Ford would say, part of the team, our team, because we have often felt like voices crying in the wilderness as we have considered things such as the agroforestry policy which we believe will benefit tremendously from our work and particularly the blood, sweat and tears of the forest gardeners, Maya, Garifuna, Mestizo, Creole, everybody who believes in this way of planting trees that don't talk back, plants that regenerate themselves. And we learn from the cultivation of these plans, cultivation of friendships, cultivation of love that builds bridges across the world, because now this is a peace walk. I would like to invite my colleagues to share their perspective in a more specific way. And before doing it, and just say a little bit about peace and reconciliation opportunity that El Pilar provides. We had a situation with the BEL, company some time ago where 
six to seven more or more of our trees were destroyed at the school garden. And we have used this as an opportunity to educate and to inform and to develop collaborative links for our children in developing a succession strategy that this will be part of the curriculum, not just for Santa Familia, but for schools all over Belize and all over the world. I thank you and I invite, I invite Dr. Ford to share her perspective and the others. Annabelle. Greetings. Um, since my main part will be talking about the Milpa cycle, I thought I would invite um, Amor Abando, a, a forest gardener himself. We've been looking, we'll see a few of his, um, his contributions after his song. So I want him to sing about the Milpa. It's in Spanish, but there are key points that he brings up. So listen carefully. So you madrugada tengo mi ámpora llena mi machete bien filudo voy a rozar una manzana ahí está mi querida Juana haciendo los pistones friendo huevos y tomate haciendo el cafecito para que yo lleve al monte ya he sacado mi tarea El sol está quemando Voy de vuelta a mi casa Donde sé que me espera La taza de pozol Soy un hombre muy alegre Juego con mis chamacos Sentados en la hamaca Yo les cuento historias Mientras llega la noche A day in the life of a milpero um, I'm going to share the screen now, and I'm going to talk about how that daily life. Um, hmm, where is my here? Uh, begins, but I'm going to have to um, figure out here something. So Cynthia and I are the hosts of this event, reversed order, Belize, Guatemala uh, included, even though it's only California and Belize here. Um, we really have spent a great deal of, of our lives looking at the values of the Maya forest. And uh, I, somehow this will go ahead on its own. So I'm gonna try to uh, keep it um, in control. One of the reasons why people had the kind of milpa that they, we were talking about and how, I mean, he, even though he went out with his uh, finely um, uh, sharpened machete, they came with stone, with managing fire and gained skill on this landscape. And we have to remember that the whole heritage is something of uh, uh, without any plow or a cow. And that's gonna be somewhat of the theme in this little talk. In fact, if you can think of your own house and the things that you have around your house, um, if you may have bushes and trees and uh, grass and other kinds of things, those are all uh, part of your life. And if you leave that place, the relics, and this is the relic of uh, the Maya forest, the relics are 
these very useful trees. So these trees were selected over centuries, generations, and you know lifetimes of um, of uh, use in this forest. So the working with nature, of course, so you don't see introduced species in the past. You can see that. Um, that all of the kinds of things you need, you need latex, poison, construction, food, medicine, products. And in this case, only one of the trees uh, has wind is pollinating it. And this is a factor that has really affected the, what we call the ecological imperialist and how they, um, how they actually uh, look at the landscape. They think of, of it either with trees or without trees. And since the only one of the Maya plants that, uh, the Maya forest plants that has wind to pollinate it, it thinks that the, if they have not a lot of Brassima malacastrum, which is actually Ramon, uh, that means there's no trees. It's a very big mistake. You can see that the other, uh, in fact, 90, like 98% of the plants in the Maya forest are populated, are pollinated by animals. So insects, bees, bats, moths, so forth. So they will not be represented in a pollen rain. You have to say achoo where it to be represented. Again, people think like Malthus that you have to clear more land to get it uh, to get more product, but they're forgetting that it's not just food you eat, you have to have everything. So uh, you have to have a, a, a thatching for your roof, poles for your house, firewood for your food, uh, fruits to eat that take, you, you plant a tree of fruit, it's not gonna produce. In fact, I understand that Corozo, here's a, uh, we have Corozo here, um, it, it takes 18 to 25 years for a, a, for a palm to produce. So if you want Corozo, um, you, can't have, you can't just go and say, I'm gonna have, plant a tree and have it. You have to be planning. So you have to plan for 18 years. I don't know how long it takes to get a fruit for um, a Chico Zapote, but each thing you have to, you can't just say, oh, I wanna plant a tree and the next year get a Chico Zapote. Five years. Five years, it takes five years to get a uh, Chico Zapote. So you have to plan, if I want Chico, I'm gonna to have to plant it. So this is really important. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the one side is the uh, imperialist side, and that was actually a redrawn from a national uh, geographic uh, picture. And then I used that and tried to show how the cycle, let's see if it, let's, you can see the cycle. It changes, uh, changes from uh, uh, a place that is, you know, has different kinds of, at, you have open fields, you have, early succession and you have mature forests. All of those provide the necessities of life. What was, what's happening now, and this is a little sequence, if you look, it goes from 1994, when LP, just before El Pilar was, a, um, was declared a reserve, and then it shows what's happening all around up to 2020, where the expansion of Spanish lookout is really encroaching on all the forest here. And over that time, the boundaries are established. We have parallel management plans and we established our uh, theme at the model school garden where no child is left indoors. But the harassment and the thought of slash and burn, rather than thinking it's select and grow, and also the idea that uh, we, don't, we only need food uh, you know, you don't, you don't need products. How do you make furniture? How do you make your house? How do you uh, uh, cover your house? How do you, uh, what other kinds of things? Everything, products in the kitchen. Um, everyone thinks in just terms of food. And of course, that doesn't give you everything you need. So the way the Maya worked was that they created a landscape that was a domesticated landscape, working with nature and creating all the necessities that they needed. Every kind of thing, the soil, we'll talk about that later, the, the plants, the organic matter, everything. But even in the 1500s, after the, um, after the, um, after the uh, uh, conquest, you can see that this uh, uh, ordinance declared that there should be no milpas in town and no trees or groves. And if there were any, they would burn them. So actually taking the life away from the people. I propose, not that I'm unique, but I should say we all have proposed, people here have taught me that it's a cycle and each one place can be one time uh, annuals, later it can be fast growing perennials and later it can be an orchard 
with closed canopy trees, the same piece of land. So if you were asking someone to take you, like the word milpa really means milipan, cultivated place in Nahuatl. So you can imagine, I'm going to make sure it doesn't go ahead. You can imagine that um, uh, a Spaniard goes out to the, what they see is a cornfield, not recognizing the you know, 30 or 40 different things that are in that field and says, what do you call this? Oh, this is my milpa or my milipan is what they say. And then later someone might go and take me to your milipan and they'd take them to a, a orchard. They'd say, no, no, that's not it. So they coined the term milpa based on their interpretation of what it was. And they didn't even know that they were looking at the entire cycle. You can actually see that at the chinampas today. Sometimes uh, if you're uh, like I am educated in, um, in a place that isn't tropical, you think that there's only crops in the fields. But if you look at this thing, maize dominated fields, yes, the maize is the tall thing you see, but underneath it are all sorts of other things happening. And you can see when you compare the home infields, which are largely uh, 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 tree crops, that there's every kind of um, habit, shrubs, trees, vines, palms, uh, uh, grasses, ferns, and trees. And you can see the same thing are in the dominate the maze, but they're smaller and they're only there hastening the uh, uh, change that will happen later on as it goes through the succession. So here's a picture. Here's the um, mi casa, what, donde, donde pisole y hamaca espera. So the, the hammock and the pisole is waiting here. Of course, this is a cosecha of, of um, of uh, uh, chiles, we would like to have some of those. This is a burned field. You might think, oh, it looks like a moonscape, but look at all the trees that are in there. They're, they're favored trees there of trees. We have 179 verified favored trees that I've found through the literature and talking with um, these master forest gardeners. And you see these cut trees in the front. Those will, many will re-sprout. Here's a planting a field in the Yucatan. These are stony places. No place for a plow, certainly. This is not arable land, but doesn't mean it's not cultivable and it doesn't mean it's not productive. This was what the Maya managed as very productive, obviously supported a civilization that rose over 2000 years. Elut in his growing maize and many other crops, if you're careful, you can see about three or four of them here. You may think this is not a field. These are all, they're called doblado, they're turned. The maize is being stored on the stalk and beans are growing up and who knows what else is in uh, Diego's garden there. It's not a dead garden at all. It's really an important location. But soon enough, you start competing with other, uh, other kinds of plants and they uh, allow the field not abandoned, they, they move it into building perennials and they are selecting selecting and of course the ones that survived it's dominant are some of those ones that were selected mahogany chico zapote and so forth and you can see here in a perennially dominated um, uh, forest forest garden that there still are bushes and other kinds of plants in there it's not something uh, without that and here we want to show we can frame uh, El Pilar as a living museum with those same plants and give people a feeling educate them in the importance of these plants as in a one resource in two countries. Um, really a beautiful place if you can imagine uh, something different, something completely different. But it, this is coming at a time when temperature is rising. Every year we have unpredictable kinds of rain uh, and, or, or less rain or more rain, floods like last year, things you can't predict, where in the past there was a lot more prediction. These heroes of the Maya forest, they know when the rain's coming and these people are dying. Leonardo Obando, uh, Alcario Cano, Heriberto Cocom, Zacarias Quischan. Many of these people have now passed on and they are the ones every time one dies we're losing an, an encyclopedia and it's not an encyclopedia you can look up. You have to follow in their footsteps and practice and we need to get more people who are following and practicing. Every time I go out with one of these wonderful uh, master gardeners, I'm learning something new. And this is where we want to use that opportunity to have no child left behind. We, we want the model school garden at Kanankash to be a model for all schools in Belize. And as uh, Cynthia said, the world. This is no time to have children not relate to nature. We can't divorce them from nature. 
the impact on climate and the relevance to tradition and the importance of trees are all something they need to learn and have a, a contact with. These are basic environmental lessons. You go out with uh, someone like Narciso and that you find. People like Narciso helped me. This is the place I rented. And then in two years, what it looked like, you know, I mean, a big difference. And this is uh, uh, thanks to a flourishing urban garden. This thanks to the collaboration with the master forest gardeners. And I want to end with one last slide that will bring us into a walk over to our um, how soil, soil is sort of the heart of this. You can't have uh, a good garden without a good soil. But if you don't, if you want to uh, be thinking about the garden, you want to reduce erosion. You want plants that cover the, the landscape to lower temperature. The more plants on the, uh, on the landscape conserves water. And of course, the differing plants maintains biodiversity that will care for people on our planet. So that's really uh, what we want to say here. And I want to uh, turn it over to uh, you. We're going to walk out. We're going to see how this goes. I have sufficient energy now. OK, vamos. And we're going to go over and look at, um, no, I stop, stop sharing here. Um, I'll be right with you. I just got to figure out how to, oh, here, stop share. OK, I, we're going to walk over and show you some soil, if, if that's possible. Will you take that? OK. This is why we really wanted to be here because this is a beautiful garden. And if, you, if you're quiet enough, you'll see the biggest iguana in the world. <laughs> What's his name? Bimbo. They call him Bimbo, but he looks like a trunk of a tree when you see him first. <laughs> well, looks like Juancito is on the, on the uh, gardening uh, front here. He's trying to forest garden. He's the forest garden. Okay, let's see how we do this. Let's see. Do you see, um, let's see. Can you see all the dirt there? Soil right there. Do I hear a yes or no? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, this is dark, this is clayey soil that he's poking at. He takes that, which is also um, filled with organic matter uh, that's from his, um, his compost. Let's see. Do you see the white? I can't tell. Do you see the white stuff? Um, go down Dolomite. a little bit. Dolomite, yeah. Let's see. Dolomite. There oh, there go. we are. That's the uh, dolomite. dolomite or, you know, marl. Aliche, yeah. And then the sun. You see the sand? Yes. And then when you mix it all together, you end up with rich soil. So rich soil that's, right there. can and you see you that? Saw, you saw anything in there and it grows. Let's see, put you on here. I have seen where the plants that I saw in this soil only have their roots around this soil. You don't go farther than that. You stay right in there because that is a rich soil. And what he does actually is add a bunch of leaves. Yeah, to organic yard. matter. We, we have everything there. The organic matter is right there. He's just planted some herbs here yeah, in his. Uh, just planted dill, but here you can see how rich. So this is, is how it looks. To, yeah. See, yeah. See how rich. So this is yeah. the soil when he brings it in. Yeah. Ready to go. Yeah. So That's let's go. That's the the secret starts with uh with that, and I think I'll turn it to him when we can get back there because. He has a mixture, he has preferred mixtures. Yeah. And what he does, he does that ahead of time. But you can leave that, how long do you leave that? Well, that can last for as long as you want to yeah. keep it and then you use as early as you want because that is what gives you the good crop. But I mean, if you were mixing it, would you leave it there for a month or? I or use it right away. Right I away, so when you mix, you're using it right yeah. away. Yeah, I'm using it right away, always in demand. So he, uh, he's always doing that. And the thing is, is that he's, if this is coming, it's a clay soil around here, but he puts his compost in it and it becomes this very rich base. It worked. Yeah. So 
I think that I'd like to start with the soil. I used to have a talk where, every, where my crew would call it, it's the soil stupid. <laughs> uh, the Maya actually, if I did a talk on Maya settlement, they have a very preferred place they live where they work. And well, it's the friable uplands. Mr. Zul can tell you that part of our agricultural practice in Belize has been to search out where the Mayas were. Mm -hmm. And once you find some archaeological site, you tend to do your milpa or your plantations around, <laughs> around there because you know the Mayas were very wise in selecting yeah. terrain. Look at that. Selecting the soil. And they knew every ingredient was right there. Mm -hmm. The soil was good. They had water. They had good sunshine. They had air. And that's all it needed mm -hmm. for you to have. And the Mayas survived on very limited things like pumpkin, corn, beans, and vegetables. That mm -hmm. was their main state. That I found I found that they really use a lot of chaya. Yeah, plenty of chaya. If you notice, my hedges around the, the yard here mm -hmm. are planted with chaya. Does everyone all know anything planted. about chaya? Are there any? Uh, go on. <laughs> all planted with isote. Remember the plant yeah. that you took? Oh, I you remember <laughs> one of my faves. <laughs> yeah, that that is the isote. And That's I have, been half eaten. I have a lot of isote planted around my yard. And it's a good fence. Yeah, a good ornamental too. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, but the, we have it in California. I good, have I have isote good, good, too. Good, good, good. But that is what you find. And I allow my garden to spell me out. Mm -hmm. I read my garden. I look at my oh, soil and I say, what is germinating there? Oh, that's a kalalu. All right, protected. Oh, that's a deshikanang. Protected. Oh, that's a mango. Protected. I, and I protect these are, all these those. These are what you call the recommendations, right? All, all those things that sprout. Well, tell me, you were, you were talking about some place you just cleared as an experiment to see yes. what comes up. I just clean a parcel of the area. Not very big. Not very big, and then I allow plants to just grow. Mm -hmm. I have a cotton tree growing there. I have a fig tree growing there. They just came up. And glassy wood, you were saying that's really important for uh, making posts. That's right. That's right. So it is, it is a fortune that you have in a piece yeah, of land. That's the wealth untold. So yeah. people are weed whacking without discrimination. No, no. Please, please, no, 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 don't, 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 don't cry, don't make don't, me cry. Yeah, no, don't do that. I have, I have things here that I protect mm -hmm. because it just- But if you don't, if you use a weed whacker or more, you're not gonna even notice no, the recommendation. No, no, no. I, you can't respect them like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see, you have to know how to respect them. When they germinate, because they will not germinate all the time. They will only germinate a certain time. Yeah, like for instance, if you, and that again goes back to the milpa system, mm -hmm. where you say, oh, they have burnt the place. They have destroyed the place. You know how many species will come out of that burned area? How, when the atmosphere is correct, when the environment is correct, that is when those plants will grow. They will not grow before then. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's some things that are really requiring the burning. Like if you yeah. wanted sikinche, you wouldn't get it. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it is it is nature as it at its best mm -hmm. when you do these practices. So this is like uh, uh, you call it uh, no no work farming, but you have to know kano what 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 you're doing. That's right. You can't just hang out in the hammock and think something's going to grow. No, you have to select. That that this hammock is mm -hmm. to tell stories. Mm -hmm. the That's kids. the historias <laughs> later. What do you have to say? Yeah, after the pozole. I think that Alfonso is the first one that taught me about the idea of recommendation. And I have a, I have a tree. I, well, I don't. I do have a tree now. But I, there was a tree in my neighborhood that's called um, loquat, and it's very. I mean, it really is happy just planting itself everywhere, and it would plant in my front door. No, I don't want that there. And uh, it plants in a place that I did was competing with a tree. I don't want it there. Finally, one planted itself at the margin of my little teeny property. And it's a pretty tree. I don't know if it, it, the leaves are a little like Oja Ancha. And okay. it has a little, uh, a very nice fruit that's yellow. Okay. And I said, 
I'm going to take that recommendation. So I want you to talk a little about how how that kind of farming is. I mean, I really like the idea that you have to take the recommendation. Well, uh, in my experience, see, can you the land me? itself will tell you what will grow best on it. Okay, that's what you let yes. the land let speak the land for itself. Speak to you, mm -hmm. and then you will learn what Pretty. will grow best and mm -hmm. what will not grow. Mm -hmm. And um, all you need to do is to select it. The, the ones that you like, for whatever reason, one of the main reasons is that it will give you benefit. Mm -hmm. There are trees in the forest that are of no benefit to you for, for the present. It might be beneficial for somebody else. But what you really want is for your land to give you the best possible uh, benefits that you can derive from it. And so if you're a medicine person, you might be picking medicine. But if you like fruits, yes. you might be picking favoring fruits. And the forest will yield a whole range of uh, species of trees that produce fruits that is good for us and good for the animals. That's another and point, An the if animals. If you go into a forest and you hear no bird singing like just now, and you don't see any animals, it's a dead place. It is because the forest doesn't have any food for these creatures. When they have food, they will come and find it. And so the forest can only team with animal and bird life when there is food. And so here this is where the selection then comes into play. Well, and some, some of those animals are ones that humans might want too. Yes. I have I remember, I remember on, on my plot of land, uh -huh. it's a very good story. I had 24 acres of land and there was not a single spice tree on it. So I didn't know how to how to propagate spice. Incidentally, I was passing by my, my uncle's house and he was drying some spice. So I went up to him and I said, Uncle, how do you know that the, the, the spice seed is is dry enough. Oh, he said, that's easy. Mm -hmm. Put it in the sun. And then you pick up some with your hand say, and you shake your hand. If you hear a rattling noise, the spicy it is dry enough. If you do not hear it, it's not dry enough. Is it? So that's what See an example. hearing. He grabs a small amount of it. You hear anything? I say, no. That means the spice is not dry. So. Now this one is dry, he says, it goes into the... You hear the nutty noise? I said, oh yes. So this one can be stored. So you let the, the, the plants talk to you, you let the soil talk to you. And so you gain that experience and you share it with others. So he said, by the way, I said, how do you propagate the seed? He says, oh, he says, you pick the, the, the ripe ones, and how do you know when to cut it? So well, you look at the tree, and if you see a lot of ripe ones, that means all the seeds are mature. So you limb it, and you collect the seed. Then I remember a Jamaican man telling me a story in Toledo. He said a specialist came to Jamaica to propagate uh, uh, spice. And he collected all the dry seeds and he tried to germinate it, and not one of them germinated. That's the, the top down. The, the, the Jamaica man <laughs> said, You're the fool. He, said, he didn't know that spice does not grow dry. So once it's dry, it's dead. <laughs> you have to plant it and when it's ripe. Green. When yeah, it's ripe. Right. So I asked my uncle if he knew what they say. Yes, he said, That's why when the little bird eat it right. And yeah, well, remember, uh, uh, remember Zacharias said it had to be cooked. Mm -hmm. You can't just have it, it just can't, you can't just take it. It has to go through the bird. Yes. Yeah. It's best when it goes through the bird. So I said, um, would you mind giving me some of the, the, the spicy? They say, yes, that's right. Pick, pick the right ones. So I picked a handful of the right ones and went home. I got an old bucket and I threw the seed in there. I must admit that a lot of them came out, but I didn't, I didn't transplant it. So my, my mother-in-law was more curious than I am. He said, why don't you transplant? One of these days I will, I told 
So one day she took the bucket and took it, took it outside and buried the bucket. <laughs> and? And the tree grew up. <laughs> and in about five years' time, the spices began to grow. And the little birds come and eat it. Now you have to eliminate the small Spice trees that trees. are growing in the family. Mm -hmm. It becomes a weed now. Everywhere mm -hmm. there is a tree. Yeah. So that is the nature of the trees in the forest. So if mm -hmm. you mind them, one species that you like best or one that you prefer, you take care of it, it will propagate itself. And in time, you'll have a spice forest or you'll have a mahogany forest or you will have a cedar forest, but you have to work Colour. hand in hand with nature. Mm -hmm. Hand in hand with nature. Mm -hmm. Right now, for instance, I have a lot of wild papaya, the mm -hmm. male papaya. Mm -hmm. Now you have to have the two papayas to get papaya, but the male one are those little ones Round out here, one. see? Mm -hmm. And man, the birds love it. So I grow them for the birds. Mm -hmm. The two kinds come here by the dozens to eat it. But they just propagate like that. I think that's something I really learned going out to uh, Kol, Chak Kol Ha. Maybe you could talk a little about. Uh, one of the things I see is this concept of animals. But if you don't have a live forest garden, you don't have a garden at all. And if you don't include them, I think you have a real soft spot for those animals. Too soft sometimes. <laughs> he lets them eat all the all the cacao. <laughs> we do have a cacao here, though. Mm. Um, a young cacao. Well, I am uh, very happy to be um, sharing some of my learning or my experience. I um, I like to live not only for myself. I like to work for other creatures that don't have no machete. So um, I plant, but not only for me, I plant to propagate. I, I, I think about giving away, I, I think about sharing, I think about letting things grow by themselves. Sometimes because um, in, in, my, um, in my point of view, I, I see that there is no no plant that have no uses. Yeah, Everything, gone. even even grass, some grass are medicine. Uh, and and if the grass is not good for me, it's good for the cow, you know. <laughs> well, maybe do you think it's uh, time to get questions? It's going a long long time. Can someone ask? Is it we've got some themes here? The the recommendation sharing with people, sharing with the animals, working with nature. Um, can we go to the questions? Or stop we'll, at the intermission? We'll have our little intermission, unless there's something else that either of you, well, any we of you want to on. add. We can go, um, go on, but uh, I think that's for the next time. OK. We'll um, then everybody be thinking of questions, and you can start to submit those through the chat session um, as we're doing the polls, and send them to the pro-organic host instead of everyone, if you would. And I'll go ahead and do the polls. on. Have you considered carbon marketing as a financial mechanism to sustain the Maya forest garden? Can I answer? Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to, to say that my function in this process is a community liaison. And one of the things we are very strong on is engagement of community and indigenous people. And so that is the power of my being here in the United States because it is one of the few opportunities we have to develop links with the um, institutions and organizations here in the United States that have the resources and the technical assistance to guide us in this kind of conversation and I just wanted to present that um, we are looking to look at models 
um, throughout the world and different parts of Central America? So the answer is no. We haven't really considered that. Our focus is on consolidating uh, our experience and our journey and celebrating and affirming and giving value to the indigenous people and indigenous knowledge, which includes um, Garifuna. I need to say that I am with the Garifuna Nation and I am here in um, California sponsored by the Garifuna Nation, which is changing the conversation about the, the indigenous voice and different ways of knowing and being. I wanted to acknowledge also Felicita Canton, who is from up north, our Maya healer, leader. And also there are people from South Africa. I am a Kellogg fellow. Dr. Ford asked me to please mention that because I don't usually do that. And as a Kellogg fellow, um, I am intent in engaging with the foundation to see how we can have support, to have the resources to um, move forward in these conversations. So we would love your collaboration in this respect. Uh, I also want to acknowledge um, John Zippard, who is uh, board chair of the Rural Development Leadership Network here in the United States, who have been very supportive in leaders, supporting me as a leader in Belize, in engaging communities to have the voice, to have the courage, to have the articulation to know how we could move forward. So really appreciate this. I also noticed some of my colleagues from South Africa who are on this, um, on this call, who are part of a leadership network for the Kellogg Foundation. Okay, our next question is, I understand that there are different grades of the dolomite. Where do you buy your dolomite and what is the ratio of dolomite to sand? I don't know that. I have no answer for that. I'm not your technical person, maybe Dr. Ford or Narcisse or Ovando, I don't have the answer for that. We don't. Maybe the other members of my team. So Dr. Annabelle, or can anyone give an answer yeah. for that one? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I, I realized uh, uh, that we uh, it was on mute there. So go on, start on. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we can. Dolomite is the layer below the one inch or three inch topsoil that we have in my area. So you take away the topsoil and you have all dolomite and that you can get in any amount the tonnage that you want. Actually, in the citrus industry, we use that in 100 parts mesh and use it to correct the acidity in the soil. So it has been commercially used, but here I just use it for the mixture of my soil and um, it works beautiful. So dolomite, is unexhaustible as such over in my area. But it's also, it, it's, uh, it may be dolomite or uh, just a regular limestone. Regular uh, but caliche. All, caliche yeah. will you, be fine. The way you mix it is like five to one. The oh, way yeah. I mix it with the soil, the way I mix my soil is six parts soil, regular soil, two parts sand, and two parts dolomite. Or calcium. Or, or caliche. That's how I mix to get a rich soil. Yeah. Okay, great. So six to two to two. Okay. Three to one. Yeah. Three to one to one. Three to one and one. Okay. All right. Um, someone just moved to a new land area and they want to know how they can best learn to one, recognize the plants, and two, know what plant, what to plant here that's best for a beautiful landscape and one that supports animals and birds. So I guess the person's asking how they can get to know their land and recognize the plants. Fonto has a great uh, article on this. Everybody needs to have a very uh, good knowledge of, of the area that he is working on. In that way, you will be able to see the low areas, the stony areas, and what things grow on it. So naturally, if you know your land, then you will know what will also grow on it. The kind of trees that grows on the land will tell you what kind of crops 
will also grow on it because agricultural crops require good green rich soil so if you have a stony area in your piece of land just look at what is growing there and if you find anything that is of interest to you or of benefit to you those are the things that you should cultivate in that area because if you try to grow anything else on that area it will not grow the same thing applies to the lowland areas where water settles only those plants that will grow there that love plants you also have to make a comparison with them um, agricultural crops that like wet areas the only other thing you can do if it is possible if you want to grow any other things on it is to drain the poorly drained land and in that way you can make it a much more productive land that is my recommendation for your land I, I remember reading something where you said to spend, he, he, said, he wrote that you spend about a year looking at where the water settles, where the water drains, and getting to know the plants and what you like. And to get to know the plants, that was the other question. You're going to have to study those. That's a, that's a study. And then walk in the, you can apprentice with people. Yeah, but then you can, just like how I formulate my soil, you can formulate the soil in any area. Mm -hmm. If you have a rocky base, I am landscaping right now a parcel of land in Belmopan, very rocky. So what I do, I put soil there, I put organic matter first, mm -hmm. and then I put soil on top, and then I, I make it to the level of what I want to plant. Mm -hmm. If I want to plant a perennial tree, I make sure I dig a pit, and that pit is filled with organic matter, mm -hmm and then soil, and then I put the plant, and the plant grows well. And so, then also, it has leaves that'll drop down that's and, right. and enrich the- uh, if, you notice, if you notice right by the hedge there, I have a black bag in there. That mm -hmm. black bag there has only leaf litter. Mm -hmm. Only leaf litter, because I will take, I don't burn. I don't burn, I am against burning. So all things that is shed by the forest, I gather it and I use it as a mulch, and I use it as a Just like you did source to decompose, and I put soil on top of that, mm -hmm. and I plant on oh, top of that. Oh, oh my. Yeah, I make the, the topography. Yeah. I okay. Any more to that? Okay. Um, someone would like to discuss the biochar. How is the meal per burn traditionally implemented? Oh, you could talk us. Uh, Cutting and burning, but you want to talk about how, being, how do you how do you cut and burn? How do you select? Um, to burn an uh, area, um, I think you need to to um, do it in the morning when when there is no wind blowing, when it's very calm, and then you have to do a fire fire pass. We we call it. To um, make sure that contain the fire, that is, is tap or contain the fire, you do a back, back fire. and then if the if the wind is is blowing from the east, you you light it on the west, so it, the the fire will go backward, and don't have a force to to run run on the other area that's not um, cleared or you know. Yeah. Now that's just a touch of of the kinds of knowledge and skills. So the idea of slash and burn being deliberately nasty to the environment is not if you see a good farmer like i've been to alfonso um, zacarias kishan he makes a trace but with that backfire corroso dead you know dead leaves on corroso won't even be touched so the fire is a very controlled kind of burn yeah, and in fact if you think about the kinds of fires we had like last year they burned almost all of el pilar got burned yeah um it's because we're not having the milpa system there anywhere so, and someone lit exactly opposite what you say, mm -hmm. when the wind was high and the hot wheat was hot and probably in the middle of the day and it just ran. And, hurricane. and you can't, you can't, I mean, that would not be what it would be like. And the cycle, how it works every 20 years, you're burning. So you're actually reducing fuel and it, the, the ne neighboring manzana, I will use manzana or hector, um, you may have the field here, but next to it is a, a mature trees and over here are our secondary growth you can't it can't run there yeah another factor too is your 
it's your knowledge of the dry season. Mm -hmm. In Belize, for example. Can you hear? Yes. In yeah. Belize, for example, the, the, the severe dry season without a drop of rain is something like four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, a, a careful person who is using the milpa system would burn his milpa before the three weeks is ended. Mm -hmm. Because after three weeks, the fire becomes extremely dangerous. Yeah. Okay, they but know that. You, That's the you, unique. Yes, if mm -hmm. you clean the field and you burn it before the three weeks, perfect. Mm -hmm. The fire is not going to run mm -hmm. because the, the soil is not dry enough yet. Ah, yeah. When the soil gets dry, then you have a real danger with fire. Mm -hmm. so and, knowledge and, of the dry season yeah. is important and to burn I, it. I learned that it's a yumik. Mm -hmm. The man who knows how to read the you we were talking the, the, the fire, but he's I called it fire tender, but eek is wind. Mm -hmm. So he's really a wind tender. And when that person does the fire for you, he's the professional. He knows all those things and knows mm -hmm. when you can and can't. Mm -hmm. So we're In foolish Belize, for with For example, you can burn your field without any risk up to the thirtieth of March. You think after that? the thirtieth of March. You yeah, have for, to be careful. Mm -hmm. so, care. there's there's some practice. What we should be doing is some of these people who are interested in learning the trees should go out with the forest gardeners and be an apprentice and follow in the footsteps. When I was first here, all the people I knew, I'd say, how did you learn that? I followed in the footsteps of my parents. So if you don't, you won't. Mm -hmm. Yes, next. Um, are there efforts, any efforts to educate farmers on the proper way to burn? Well, you know, in the old days, they had extension officers that went out, but I, it, that actually went out. You're looking at one, talking to one. <laughs> uh, but I, I just talked to an extension officer at Central Farm. Oh, yes, send them into my office. I am, uh, on, am I on mute? <laughs> No, no, you're not on mute. <laughs> I wanted to say something about land from an indigenous perspective. Um, you remember? Oh, now she's on mute. No, you're no. on mute now. I followed um, someone, one of the Garifuna Forest Gardeners, Baba Francis Lewis. And I just wanted to say that for indigenous people, and let me speak Garifuna, who have educated the nation, including the Maya, um, we look at land as sacred and land is not just physical. It is a level of consciousness to describe land is an intangible relationship. So I just wanted to present that in different ways of knowing and how we discovered that in universities here in the United States in mapping, Maya leaders were brought here to Berkeley California for some weeks to map out their own landscape because the relationship of indigenous people to land um, has a language and a way of being of its own. So I just wanted to, um, to present that as a new way that we are moving forward. We know of the Maya Atlas and certainly with the Garifuna Nation, we are looking at land as a sense of relationship and awareness in addition to the physical relationship with land. And that is why Dr. Torres speaks about feeding the birds and giving away and being available for everyone and for everything. So um, that is an area that we are certainly presenting as we move forward in, in educating, um, in changing what we mean by education and celebrating the indigenous knowledge. Just the other day when I realized uh -huh. that when I breathe, when you breathe, I, when I breathe, I breathe carbon, I, I breathe oxygen, exactly. I exhale carbon dioxide. Exactly. It's breathing. Breathing the carbon mm -hmm. dioxide and exhaling. Let's gas, as I call it. Uh, exhaling <laughs> the oxygen. Uh -huh. So yes. that's a relationship. That's right. That's a relationship. That's right. Direct relationship, relationship with the rest of nature. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't acknowledge it. This is what we Jeez, want to right learn, yeah. <laughs> learn a lot from the relationship. I remember as a Garifuna going to my grandmother's land. I know I go to Barranco and it's not just how many acres. It's about knowing that this is where 
my grandmother and my people walked, you know? And so that's a very important dimension of knowingness and being that we can tap into and affirm as being very powerful in, in how we move forward. If we have viewed the land in this kind of sacred way, we would not be treating it with the abuse that we are treating it with all the plastic and all the garbage and all the dirt and all the ways that we are desecrating land. So I believe that is a very important part of the indigenous being that needs to be lifted up in these policies that are being developed in our countries and in the world. Yes, we want the relationship you were talking about. Yeah. Next. Okay, um, let me see. Um, one person submitted that they've been planting things on their land for about a year and nothing is gro wanting to grow. And the, gra the ground is pure what? sand and clay. So suggestions? <laughs> yeah. I think that they need to revisit the whole thing. They need to begin by composting. They need by they need to continue by enriching their soil, making their own soil, formulating it, and then putting it in the area where they want to plant. And you tell me if they make so many bags of six two two and put it there and they plant there, it will grow, guaranteed. And don't burn, compost, don't burn. White weed whacker. That's right, white weed whack. You can take your palm shrouds, you can take leaves, you can take anything and make plant food. Yeah, just yesterday we were at the, um, the uh, uh, governor, you know, what is it called? The government house. And there were a bunch of leaves and, and the president of Niche was saying, oh, we need to clean up. And Narciso says, that's good. You should just put it over there on those poor, uh, 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 well, yeah. it was like exposed roots. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a matter of knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. what do you do with it? And then you could have, um, if your land is very bad, you could do bucket gardening or... Yeah, bucket gardening. That's yeah. the other solution. Yeah. I'm, I'm moving to that. I have a little problem in my garden where I like my oak tree, but the oak tree likes all the water that I, I provide for the garden. So I've started to remove them into buckets because uh, then it doesn't have the, the re roots don't go in there. Well, you see all that soil that I have there, that's mm -hmm. going to Belmopan because Belmopan is rocky. Oh yeah, you said that. Imported mm -hmm. soil to build yeah. on, but after you get it going. Very poor, poor in, poor in drainage. Yeah. Very well, when you, when you get it started, though, it should be good. Hard, uh, very yeah, hard, really bad, hard. really bad. You could add, add ashes too to your soil or, you know, ashes. Yeah, from, from your, gar from your uh, kitchen. From your <laughs> kitchen. But it's a sense, it's a sense. Mm -hmm. You need to get and, and into then, it, heart and soul. And then mm -hmm. I think another point. That get into it, heart and soul is the the bottom line. Has to do with uh, where are the plants can, being planted? Yeah. I'm just in front of the second largest district. I don't think they can hear you. No. Well, do you have a next question? Have or can you hear it? So no matter what you do with it, it you have to not. selectively put plants that will like try less to try yeah. shape. Yeah. See? Mm -hmm. Again. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. <laughs> Not all plants will do, mm -hmm. some will. So it, again, knowledge is... Those plants are happy right there. They love so you plant where there's, you know, you work the soil, it's the soil at the bottom line, yeah. and watch what comes up. Good soil, enough sunlight, and enough water. Mm -hmm. It should grow. Mm -hmm. Attention. Oh, okay. Love. Lots of love. It's free. Yeah. And love. And my, mom, my mom talks and sings to her plants. I hug trees when I go to El Pilar and I'm there in the essence of heaven. I hug the copal tree and all the different trees. <laughs> and when Dr. Torres and I, we are walking through the, the 5,000 acres, Belize, Guatemala, then we are really in heaven because the, 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 the plants present themselves. They are a part of life. And this is what our El Pilar journey is about, to have that love, that wow. love of nature it brings us the best, brings out the best in us. And that's why El Pilar is a model for a peace, a oh, peace yeah. part for humanity. And that's where I, I get to report Miss Cynthia, but there must be two heavens then. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> because the yard is one of them. 
<laughs> we are out in in Obando's yard here, and I can tell you, you must be a Garifuna because we believe that you know the connection between heaven and earth. So you must be Garifuna, Mr. Sewell. <laughs> must be indigenous anyway. Heaven, heaven is here. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. In fact, point. I say to to people, you know, heaven or hell. If you want to live in hell, you can make your hell, or you want to make your hell, you make your heaven here. Right, right in that hammock. Yes. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'd like to say that I appreciate all the wonderful questions. That I really think it's time for us to uh, close up and and thank everyone for their good questions and their attention, and look for another time we can all chat again. Yeah, that, thank you, Annabelle. Okay. Um, we are very um, delighted for this invitation, and I especially want to thank Alex Webb, who is on from the University of Florida, uh, all the people who have yeah, taken- Bob Carr, I'd like to say hello to Hi, Bob. Bob told we have a plant in his name at El Pilar as well, and uh, all our family, friends, loved ones, and um, I'll be here waiting for you, Annabelle. <laughs> I'm in California. <laughs> Well, <laughs> Carmen Belize, love you all, and it's all about love, indigenous love. That's yes. for humanity. And the plants you here, no more. to love. <laughs> the plants teach us how to love. We have one last. We can leave <laughs> with one last song if you want, because I, I I like Machucando uh, Corozo. So sure. this is the here's here's Corozo. He said him. I love you all. Yeah. Es bueno machucar corozo, pom 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 pom. Es bueno machucar corozo, pom 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 pom. Pero hay que hacerlo bien. 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 Porque cuando está bien fino la manteca rinde más. Porque cuando está bien fino la manteca rinde más. Lo metes en el pilón y le das con el bastón. Lo metes en el pilón y le das con el bastón. Le das por aquí le das por allá. Cuando está bien fino, entonces puro pum 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 Kellogg Foundation alumni leaders. So we have the world present here, John Zippard, our leader from the Rural Development Leadership Network. And um, yeah, Elena. So thank you very much for, for taking the time to be with us. And we will continue this conversation and this campaign to love the earth and to have a deeper relationship and sacred respect for Mother Earth, sorry guys, Mother Earth. <laughs> thank you. All right, we'd like to thank our panelists that we have today for such a great presentation. Thanks everyone. And in conclusion, I would like to say that we are having our next general meeting for Pro Organic on June 19th at three o'clock via Zoom. Um, also remember you can find Pro Organic Belize on our Facebook page and also our Facebook group. We also have a website at pro-organicbelize.org. And would also like to announce our next speakers meeting will be on July 3rd with Dr. Ed Bowles. We will be discussing Belize Water Resources. So everybody that's interested in Belize Water Resources, uh, I think this time we're going to get um, Ed to talk about 
water resources in relation to small farms and home gardens. So anyone who's interested in that, it will be the same time, but it will be on July 3rd for next speaker's meeting. All right, I would thank like to thank all. everyone for coming. Thank you.